methodology. Remember the last time you used an app, watched a movie, went out to eat, or procured any goods or service really? In some cases, a pop-up or customer service employee will appear to ask you, do you have time for a survey? We just want to know what you think. Actually, it's more realistic that the pop-up won't go away until you've clicked through many dialog boxes to dismiss it, and the person would shove the form in your face with the force of an order, not a request. Okay. Half accepting and half annoyed, you answer. Please rate how satisfied you are with our service or like the product. That's the form, followed by scales ranging from agree to disagree, love it, to hate it. Absent-mindedly, you check boxes to say, you did good enough. Please, just leave. And then the dreaded question comes. Why did you like it? From our discussion on theories and philosophies, we learn that what we assume about human nature influences how we think we can best capture the depth and breadth of our experiences, from the most trivial to the most complex. And these beliefs translate into what questions we ask and how we ask them. So, researchers tend to ask one of two types of questions. How much and why? One results in numerical data, a score that quantifies liking, agreement, and abilities. The other gives out narratives, stories, the qualitative ways by which we make sense of our lives and surroundings. If research is intended to help us answer our questions, then research methods shape how we ask those questions and what form those answers take. Either way, psychologists are more respectful and we promise we won't intrude on your privacy if you don't want us to ask you things. The methods we use differ in a lot of ways, depending on the purposes they serve. We have many methods in psychology that differ based on their characteristics and considerations. We use different methods based on what we aim to do with our study because some research purposes are best resolved using some approaches than others. Aside from the paradigm or worldview we're working from, we can ask three other questions to guide our choice of method. The first question is about our level of analysis. Who are we focusing on? When we focus on individuals, what makes them unique, and how complex their experiences are, we opt for an ideographic approach. This is the level of analysis you'd see in case studies, phenomenologies, and other similar qualitative methods that aim to understand the unusual or extraordinary circumstances of specific persons. Meanwhile, when our goal is to generalize, to see what trends apply to larger populations or groups, we take a nomothetic approach. Quantitative methods like experiments and surveys aim to uncover principles and mechanisms which guide anyone's actions or as long as they're similar enough to the people part of the original study. So, ideographic studies allow you to get in-depth insights that apply to specific cases, while nomothetic studies give you a wide breadth of application based on a more general understanding of the phenomenon. Next, You'd ask about participant involvement. Do the participants know that they're participating? In non-reactive methods, people are not aware of their participation because you're neither obtrusive nor intruding into their lives. Instead, you look at how they live their lives in a natural setting. For example, physical taste measures allow us to see how people behave by using the materials and environments around them. In erosion, wear and tear indicate what people use. Piles of garbage mean many people live there. Brown paths on green patches of grass mean that people take that as a shortcut. Loose doors and broken handles mean people often pass by. Then, accumulation tells us what things people use, collect, or discard. For example, how do you find out who people will vote for in the next elections without asking? A lot of research groups found creative answers. One group went to parking lots and looked at the bumper stickers on cars. Another dove by a neighborhood and counted the posters and signs in front of households. We also have sales of a drink depending on which candidate's face is on the cup, hashtags of support on social media, you get the idea. If you are not fond of physical traces, you can do a search of archives and public records or do secondary analyses on publicly available data. Or resort to observation, look at external appearances, what actions people do, and how long it takes for them to finish a task. The point is, the participant lives their life, studied from afar by the curious researcher. Within bounds of ethics, of course. So, all other methods fall under the reactive category because in one way or another, participants are aware that they're undergoing a study, 
whether the setting is as contrived as a controlled experiment or as natural as a random scheme. Whether you give them a survey, put them in a lab, or engage them in a detailed interview, they know you're doing research and they'll ask in their head, why is this weird psychologist asking me too many questions? Be careful with this distinction though. In some cases, researchers can interact with a participant, but the latter doesn't know that the interaction is part of a study. For example, in 1976, Robert Cialdini and co-researchers studied how people display their group affiliations depending on the group's victories and failures. In their study, they sat down watching students go about their lives on campus the day after their university's team competed against a rival university's football team. When their team won, students came to school bandishing their pins, flags, shirts, jackets, and all possible accessories to shout that their team won. Another week, another game, and their team lost. The next day, all of the accessories disappeared. In another study, the researchers called up the students, pretending to be people from another unrelated organization, just curious about their opinions on the game. When the team was victorious, the students discussed how we were great in the game because we practiced and that's why we won. When the team was defeated, the students narrated how they performed badly because they were distracted and unready, so they lost. Remember that these students were just supporters and audiences to these matches, and they were not part of the team. Cialdini and co-researchers called this effect basking in reflected glory, the tendency to flaunt one's connections with the successful other, and the converse of dissociating from the team, cutting off reflected failure. In both studies, the participants were not explicitly aware of their participation, even if interaction was present in the setting. Finally, you'd also ask, why are you doing research? What do you want to achieve? Basic research is concerned about understanding phenomena, including the processes or meanings that underlie them. In this mode, you're trying to figure out the reasons and conditions for behavior in order to come up with an explanation or theory. Then, once you have a model, you do even more basic research to test it out. Another mode, translational research, takes the findings from basic research and adapts them to solve a particular real-life problem but with an interest towards seeing in which context or visual theory still applies. So, translation involves both theory testing and intervention. Finally, applied research, though sometimes informed by theories or frameworks, are not particularly inclined to test them. Instead, the research problem comes directly from the communities that psychologists are working with and the studies intended to develop solutions tailored for the specific group of people involved in the study. These three look similar, so let's take a sample research problem. Say you want to understand how to improve health literacy among people. You want to know what it takes for people to practice physical distancing, proper hand washing, mask wearing, and other behaviors to prevent COVID-19 transmission. A psychologist doing basic research may focus on comprehension of health-related messages. So, they take the message, follow proper hand washing steps and give them to participants either through a diagram or an entertaining music video. Then, after the guide is shown, test the participants' memory through a measure of the accuracy of their knowledge. Next, the translational researcher sees the finding that entertaining communication promotes retention. So, they take the material and go to a community health center to conduct seminars on health-promoting behaviors. They showed the video, then see after some time how the disease transmission has changed and how many of the community members still remember the hand washing steps. Meanwhile, the applied researcher finds that despite these efforts, disease transmission is still high in the community. With that, they went from house to house and interviewed families, asked the local health workers, and observed the community members as they go about their days. The researchers discovered that the community can practice these healthy behaviors because of lack of resources like clean running water, reliable water sources and plumbing, and low general literacy and economic mobility among the members. The psychologists then work with private and public sectors to address the community's needs. What these examples show is that all three modes of research are important because they advance our science in as much as they can be used to improve the lives of the society we serve. Research doesn't stop with an answer, but continues to inspire further investigations and advocacy. The paradigms we take on and the purposes we have shape the methods that we use. 
Now that you know your level of analysis, extent of participant awareness, and research purpose, you're ready to decide on an approach. We have three, which are tied to the four main paradigms or worldviews. Quantitative methods look at the world in numbers. These focus on precise measurements that can be analyzed using statistical techniques. Because of their post-positivist assumptions, these value replicability and objectivity so you can get definitive comparisons and generalizable findings. You'd go quantitative if you have very specific and highly defined research questions, often based on a very substantial body of existing literature that informs your hypotheses. These methods work best if your research problem has been quantified in the past and you have a good way of measuring your variables. Meanwhile, qualitative methods focus on narratives, individual meanings, and constructions. For the constructivists, these value understanding, complexity, and the process of meaning-making, subjectivity, and researcher reflexivity, or awareness of personal biases which are unavoidably present in doing research. Then, the critical theorists relate individual narratives with social discourses, thus the need for an understanding of the nuances of language and shared meanings. You'd go qualitative if you have a broad research question covering an expansive set of issues, which have mostly been studied qualitatively in the past, or when few studies have been made to make sense of the phenomenon. Above all, qualitative methods are preferred when the structure and precision required by quantitative research is impossible or inappropriate. For example, a lot of studies in Philippine psychology have been conducted among samples dissimilar to the typical weird variety. Farmers, garbage collectors, blue-collar workers, all of them interviewed on site. They don't have the time to sit down and talk with you in an isolated place, so you work with the flexibility of what you can ask right then and there where they are. Finally, mixed methods approaches combine the best of both worlds. They arrive at multiple perspectives through triangulation, flexibility, and complementary insights made possible by quantitative and qualitative methods. Because these methods prioritize a the problem, they move between all the methods at their disposal to come up with practical and pragmatic solutions to the research problem. Ultimately, we're able to combine findings across fields to arrive at holistic and comprehensive conclusions. The problem? Mixed methods are exponentially more resource-consuming because each method you use technically becomes a separate study of its own. For Plano Clark and Cresswell, these differences in values and priorities across research approaches can slide into variations in how journal articles are written up. Quantitative studies are framed as explanations of phenomena, with previous literature prescribing specific and precisely defined research problems, explored using statistical analyses of numeric data, ending in generalizable trends compared against the literature to provide support or evidence for the revision of a theory. Meanwhile, Qualitative studies explore a general set of problems drawn from a dynamic reading of the literature, answered using narrative data to come up with themes, meanings, and interpretations that aim to expand our understanding of psychological behaviors. Then, mixed method studies combine these quantitative and qualitative influences, approaching research problems using both numbers and narratives. So, each method has its up and downs. But you... As a researcher, decide on which approach to take not based on your preferences, but on which would best resolve your research problem. Again, let the question be your guide and the method be your means. We have a diverse set of methods in psychological research. Psychology shares a lot of methods with the other social sciences, and all of them use these tools to investigate our personal and social worlds. Seriously, we have a lot of methods, equally complex and useful in their own right. We don't have time to take on each one, so we'll focus on the most common ones that you'll encounter in most studies. The first set of methods are called quantitative because they collect numerical data to arrive at conclusions. The most popular is the experiment, which we use to test whether a particular intervention causes changes or effects on behavior. In this design, we have two key variables the independent variable, which we control or manipulate, and the dependent variable, which we measure to see if the manipulated variable had any effect. The manipulated variable has multiple treatment groups, which have different levels of the manipulated variable, one of which is a control group where we don't do anything to make sure that it's really the independent variable that is the cause for the change. So, 
If we're studying the effects of genre of music on memorization, our independent variable is the music genre that participants are listening to, which can have treatment levels such as rock, jazz, pop, or folk, with one condition having no music at all. Meanwhile, our dependent variable is memorization, which we can measure as how many things a person can successfully recall from a list we were given to learn while listening to music. Looking at a real study, Jose Magno, Jose Magno IV, yes, there are two of them, and John Quintos published a study in 2017 to explore how people judge the morality of morally ambiguous activities such as alcohol consumption. In some cases, drinking is acceptable like when going out with friends, while alcoholism itself is viewed negatively. In their study, participants read the story of a person who went out drinking and asked participants to rate how morally acceptable drinking is when the person got drunk because of peer pressure or sensation seeking. Meaning, my friends made me drink versus I like to drink because it's fun. The researchers found that drinking is viewed as less problematic when done due to peer influence than internal personality characteristics. What's important in any experimental study is the notion of random assignment. Participants must be assigned to the levels of the independent variable in a random fashion to eliminate the confounding effects of context or personality. For example, if a study was advertised as a research on alcohol consumption, you may end up getting people who really like to go out for drinks once in a while. Then, if you don't randomize and you end up assigning all of them to the sensation-seeking condition, your results may end up inconclusive because now you're not sure if what's causing the effects are your experimental manipulations or the personality of your participants. However, some experiments can't do randomization, so we call them quasi-experiments. You still have treatment conditions, but you can't assign participants randomly like in a true experiment. For example, if you're studying how your degree program influences academic motivation, you can't tell students to shift courses for some time to test your hypothesis. So, you work with the groupings that you have, well aware that some of your findings may be due to some shared characteristics of a group, but are not their degree program. The entire point of experiments is to rule out everything to make sure that the only thing causing the change is your intervention so you can assume causality. But when the goal of your study is just to see how variables are related to each other, you can do correlation and regression studies. A correlation is a statistical test that tells us how much variables change in response to each other. Do they increase together, go in opposite ways, or are they unrelated? Meanwhile, regression is another test that tries to eliminate overlaps and confounds introduced by variables that may be unrelated to the study so we get a cleaner view of the relationship between the variables. In this case, the variables we are interested in are called predictors, the ones we measure just so they don't confound the effects are controls, and the phenomenon of interest is the outcome. Correlation and regression studies are often supported by surveys, another method which we use to describe trends, rates, and intensities of variables. While surveys are more descriptive, correlations and regressions are used to predict what variables cause what effects. The opinion service you see on the news asking how hopeful are you that next year will be better and the national population census are examples of descriptive surveys. As an example of a study that combines correlations, regressions, and surveys, Paul Labor and Maria Cecilia Conaco did a study to understand why people support extreme punishments for dog users and sellers. In their research, they distributed a survey that asks people about their opinions regarding drugs, crime, and the justice system in the country. Then, the researchers took the numerical equivalence of these opinions and ran statistical tests to see how they relate to each other. Examples of controls they added are age, gender, educational attainment, and socioeconomic status, which typically have effects on your opinions but are sometimes not the variables of interest in the research. They found that variables such as compassion were negatively related to support for very punishing actions against the users. However, what makes regression powerful is that if you have many variables, you're able to see which is the strongest predictor of your outcome. You can compare how much each variable contributes to explaining your phenomenon beyond just saying that they're related as in what correlation allows you to do. So, among the 18 variables that Labor and Konako added in the survey, they found that the strongest predictor is personal support for the president, 
The more that you agree with the president's stance on issues, the more that you're likely to also support punitive measures against drug users and sellers. Finally, related to surveys or tests or inventories, scales which measure psychological constructs or abilities like personality, intelligence, or attitudes. What makes these skills different from surveys is that they typically undergo longer processes of development and revision because we want to make sure that they are precisely and accurately measuring the phenomenon or behavior we're targeting. For example, the Masaklaw na Panukat ng Loob or Mapa ng Loob, developed by a team led by Gregorio del Pilar, was intended to be a measure of personality that draws on the empirical supports of the cross-culturally replicable five-factor theory or Big Five while having items entirely based on local conceptions of personality. Another group of methods are qualitative, focused on analyzing themes of experiences based on non-numerical data, so that includes both text and images. Narrative methods cover a lot of different techniques, but what they have in common is a goal to understand general, common themes derived from the stories, lives, and experiences of people, typically those who share some key characteristics. For example, Daniel Ochoa interviewed children and their mothers who lived below the poverty line about what moral standards they use to judge what is good and bad. While standards such as respecting elders and the property of others appear to be common with people from other socioeconomic backgrounds, her participants placed great emphasis on respect for laws and social norms, decent and dignified sources of income, and working for personal and familial economic mobility as guides for good behavior. What this finding demonstrates is that qualitative methods enable us to see not only how people make sense of their experiences, but also how their lives are connected to issues of class, power, and social representation. In a more explicit analysis of this issue, Michelle Ong investigated how Filipina migrant workers talk about their life circumstances and economic conditions, which led them to seek employment in New Zealand, thus being separated from their own families while caring for other families which are not their own. She argued that migrant stories about individual effort, perseverance, and sacrifice are consistent with a neoliberal subjectivity that produces migrants as free, informed, and agentic individuals who act and make decisions for their own welfare, despite the fact that their coerced choice to leave the Philippines can be traced ultimately to the inequitable working conditions within our country that don't allow for social security and mobility. That is, even when we study individual psychologies, we can make overarching conclusions using critical lenses that demonstrate how individual well-being is connected to prevailing discourses and systems in society. Another qualitative method is the case study, which is used to explore and describe individual cases involving very unique or rare experiences. For example, British neurologist Oliver Sacks published several books describing the cases of his patients who sustained very specific forms of brain damage. Because injuries to specific parts of the brain result in similarly distinct disruptions on behavior, and it's unethical to actually induce damage on healthy people, we rely on these rare cases to expand our knowledge on how neural and psychological functioning relate to each other. Meanwhile, Maria Teresa Tuason also used the case study, but this time to understand what people believe are the causes of poverty. In her research, she interviewed a few people who were born in poverty, with some escaping and the others staying in poor. While social perception surveys indicate that about half of Filipino families see themselves as poor, Tawson believes that there are many ways by which people experience poverty, and so it makes sense to conduct deep and expansive interviews with individuals. Indeed, she gives an extensive report of how people think about their experiences living below the poverty line, which then strongly influences their present well-being and hopes for their children to achieve upward mobility. Indeed, while the poor turned rich attribute their successes to chance, faith, and some personal strivings, those who stayed poor bemoan the lack of social welfare systems that can help them escape poverty. Ultimately, the poor turned rich recount the experiences of poverty and look back with happiness and gratitude on how their lives turned for the better, while those who stayed poor show little hope or positivity in their outlook for change. Next, when we refer to the method of ethnography, you're likely to think of an anthropologist who goes on an immersion trip to some faraway place, living with the locals to observe their life ways, then come back to their home country to report on the exotic cultural order. In fact, 
Ethnography is simply an exploration of the shared meanings, culture, and practices within a particular social group or community. That means, any group with some defining characteristic can be investigated using this method. For example, how are fandoms of a TV show, movie, artist, or musical group form? How do they coordinate their activities during fan meets, live shows, or even birthdays of the artist? What are the ethics of posting and sharing sensitive information and media on alternate Twitter or Instagram accounts? Why do people do cosplay, given that it can be a very expensive hobby to create custom and complex costumes? Are Tinder and Grindr just sites to look for dates and short-term relationships, or are they communities for which people can explore their identity and sexuality while controlling the progression of intimacy they develop with the matches? Jonathan Corpus Ong and Jason Vincent Cabanas conducted in-depth interviews with organizers and operatives of troll networks to understand how political disinformation is produced and circulated within Philippine social media. They found that to best understand trolling and fake news propagation, we have to look at everyone as part of an indicate network, from public relations operatives orchestrating the troll machinery at the top, pro-government influencers as the public face of political support, paid community moderators mobilizing troll networks at the middle, and the general uninformed populace consuming and spreading manufactured dissent and disrespectful discourse. Ethnography is useful in this context because to understand the actions of individual social media users, it is important to reveal the cultures and communities that make such large-scale disinformation possible. Finally, grounded theory studies develop explanations by drawing on the experiences shared by participants. While quantitative methods draw on existing theories to test their assumptions, grounded theory studies go beyond reports of common themes into detailed descriptions of processes, actions, and interactions among people. For example, Melissa Garabiles, Mira Alexis Ofeneo, and Brian Hall conducted focus group discussions with Filipina domestic workers and their families to identify the processes that allow them to maintain strong familial bonds despite their geographic separation. They found that resilient transnational families, with the mother living away from her husband and children, recognize that their economic conditions are not conducive to their survival and growth, such that the mother decides to work elsewhere with higher pay. Across time, the mother and the father's marital bonds, as well as the children's attachment to the mother, are retained through communication using social media, the organization of obligations, with the father now taking a direct role in child rearing and the mother in financial support, temporary reunions when the mother comes home for the holidays, and a shared goal of permanent reunification through long-term social security. As such, what differentiates grounded theory as a method is its emphasis on mapping the connections between themes to identify the processes and interactions that connect them as they unfold across time. Finally, mixed method studies rely on the predictive and causal powers of quantitative methods and the depth of explanation made possible by quantitative methods. What differentiates the many types of mixed-method approaches is the order and priorities assigned to the quantitative and qualitative components. So, which comes first, which answers the primary research question? In convergent parallel mixed-method studies, both components are of equal importance and they happen at the same time. For example, studies on educational interventions for first-generation college students the first in their family to be able to successfully enroll in higher education institutions, use quantitative methods to assess the students' competencies, abilities, and attitudes toward learning, while qualitative methods will allow school officials to understand where the student is coming from, how their material conditions can hinder their learning, and what the student hopes the institution can provide. Each first-gen student would have different backgrounds, so effective support systems must be tailored to each student's experiences and goals which can be determined only by using both sources of information. Meanwhile, sequential mixed-method approaches employ the two components in succession, whichever coming first used to answer the research question and the one coming second using to clarify or follow up points of interest. In explanatory sequential methods, quantitative data are collected and any interesting trends are explained using qualitative methods. For example, Clinical research may use tests and inventories that measure personality traits or symptoms of maladaptation that cause or indicate psychopathology or mental illness. Then, when a participant has scores that signal risk for or presence of psychological distress, the researchers may contact the participant for a clinical interview 
where they discuss the results of a test, ask the participants about why they responded to the inventory so they did, and possibly refer the participant for counseling if the quantitative and qualitative data suggests that they meet thresholds for psychopathology. Ordering the components in the opposite way, exploratory sequential methods use qualitative methods to discover the scope of a phenomenon, followed by a quantitative investigation that can test any predictions or generalizations derived from the first part of the study. This is a framework commonly used in test development. For example, Jonathan Ilagan and co-researchers interviewed employees across age, profession, and socioeconomic groups to understand what makes them motivated to do well at work. They used thematic analysis to see what the common motives of these employees are, which they then rewarded as a series of survey questions. The survey was then given to a larger group of employees to indicate how much they value each motivational theme, with the numerical data being analyzed statistically to be reduced to the researcher's final four overarching motives. Job satisfaction, organizational climate, familial priorities, and career progression. So, what started out as the experiences and perspectives of a small group of employees were then used to develop a scale that can be used to measure the motivations of the Filipino worker. In the end, a mixed method study is only effective when the insights derived from its quantitative and qualitative components are integrated to create holistic and more expansive conclusions and recommendations for psychological interventions or public policy. If you just interpret the results of the components separately while doing little to see how they can be put together, you just wasted your time doing two separate studies when maybe one would have been enough. The mixed and mixed methods is not only about using multiple strategies, but also mixing and putting together everything that we've learned in the process. The research methods we have in psychology are the tools that we use to make sense of the world. In this lesson, we discovered how methods exist at different levels of analysis, reactivity, research purpose, and reliance on narrative versus numerical data. We saw where quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods approaches can be used, what conclusions we can derive from using them, and how our research reports reflect the method we employed. Finally, we looked at some of the most common methods in psychological research with the warning that there are so many others. Until this point in the series, we have been unpacking the assumptions of research to set the stage for the methods which are at the center of psychological investigations. From here on, we take a practical stance. What makes good research? In the next three episodes, we consider issues of participant welfare and scientific rigor and the difficult balance between them. See you then.